When people think of evolutionary biology, they often think of fossils and ancient creatures, which is appropriate because fossils provide some of the strongest evidence for evolution. There are four different ways the geological record supports evolution as the mechanism that has led to the biodiversity we see today. First, the geological record indicates that the Earth is old enough for evolution to have had enough time to have occurred. Second, the fossil record provides many examples of extinction. Things that once lived are no longer with us today. Third, there are transitional forms that appear in the fossil record that show connections between different groups of organisms over time. And fourth, there is a geographic correlation between the living organisms we see today and the dead organisms we see in the fossil record. Evolution requires lots of time in order to change organisms in a noticeable way. In the 1800s, before our understanding of radioactivity, the Earth was thought to be merely a few thousand years old. That's not long enough for evolution to have created the diversity we see. Evolution can cause change in a few thousand years, but not the kind of change that created the dinosaurs or the widespread diversity we see today. In fact, back in the 1800s, the evidence for evolution led to a debate between Charles Darwin and Lord Kelvin. The theory of evolution implied that the Earth was very old, but physicists thought that the Earth was much younger based on estimates of the rate of cooling of the Earth that didn't include radioactivity. Darwin lacked the data to demonstrate that the physicists were incorrect because he wasn't a physicist, but he stood by his conviction in evolution based on other evidence, including the fossil record. This disagreement about the age of the Earth was a major problem for evolutionary theory in the 1800s. But then radioactivity was discovered, and understood. The analysis of radioactive elements present in geologic deposits revealed that some regions were millions or even billions of years old. The arguments of biologists were vindicated and physicists had to adjust their view of how old the Earth was. So how are radioactive materials used to estimate the ages of geologic deposits? Radioactive materials break down over time into less radioactive materials. The half-life of a radioactive material is the time it takes for one half of the parent material to decay into a daughter product. Each atom is on its own, with a certain chance of decaying over time, and the half-life measures how long it takes for half of those atoms to do so. Let's look at radioactive decay in a little bit more detail. As mentioned, the half-life, represented by the symbol T sub 1 half, of a radioactive material is the time it takes for one half of the parent material to decay into a daughter product. Let's look at this diagram and think about what it's representing. The red box on the left indicates an initial amount of radioactive material. Let's give it an age of zero years when it begins to decay. At that initial point, we can think of 100% of the material being the initial element and 0% being the daughter element. We can also think of this as a one to zero ratio. Ratios are often confusing to work with, but they're commonly used. After one half-life, which is T sub one-half years, half of the parent material decays into the daughter product. If we look at our initial deposit, now 50% of the deposit is the initial material, and 50% is the daughter material. That can be represented as a one-to-one -one ratio. After an additional half-life number of years, or twice the half-life number of years from the beginning, there would now be just 25% of the initial material remaining. The 25 is half of 50. Just because the atoms are older, they don't have a higher chance of decaying each year. Our deposit is 25% parent material and 75% daughter product. The ratio of materials would now be 1 to 3. After an additional half-life number of years, or three times the half-life number of years from the beginning, now there would be 12.5% of the original material remaining. The 12.5 is half of 25. Our deposit is 12.5% parent material and 87.5% daughter product. The ratio of materials would now be 1 to 7. If we are able to discover a deposit of radioactive material that has remained isolated from contamination, then a measurement of the relative amounts of the parent and daughter materials will tell us how long ago that initial deposit was formed. Finding such deposits and carefully measuring these ratios is something that geologists do to estimate the ages of different layers of rock. Of course, in reality, the ages of these deposits are rarely nice multiples of the half-life, so we have to use an equation like this to estimate the age of a deposit. This equation shows that the amount of the material, after a certain amount of time, is equal to the initial amount of the material times one-half raised to a power, which is the amount of time, divided by the half-life. For example, 
Once the time equals the half-life, that exponent is 1, and the amount of material would just be equal to the initial material times 1 half. If the amount of time was twice the half-life, the exponent would be 2, and the amount of material would be equal to the initial amount times 1 half squared, which is 1 fourth. Using this equation becomes very difficult in practice if the time is a large multiple of the half-life, because the amount of measurable material is too small. Luckily, there are a variety of radioactive materials that have a range of half-lives that allow us to accurately date many different deposits. For example, the decay from carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 is about 5,700 years, so deposits of carbon that start with a known amount of carbon-14 can be used to accurately date things up to about 30 or 40,000 years old. This is perfect for learning about early humans who left carbon deposits in their ancient campfires. At the other end of the scale are isotopes like uranium-238 and uranium-235, with half-lives that are millions of years old, which allows us to date very ancient deposits. And once physicists and geologists figured all this out, and started measuring isotopes of uranium, thorium, and lead in rock formations, they came up with ages that were ancient. This then indicated that the Earth was plenty old enough for evolution to have had time to occur. In addition to providing estimates of the age of rocks, the rocks themselves show us things that lived before via fossils, the preserved imprints of things buried long ago. And one of the most obvious things is that the fossil record is full of organisms that no longer live. Extinction has occurred during Earth's history. Animals like the Tyrannosaurus rex and saber-toothed cat shown here are very different from things alive today. This is evidence of change. The organisms on Earth have not always stayed the same. We also see clear examples of taxa intermediate between others in the fossil record. More evidence of change. For example, the fossil shown is Archaeopteryx, and you can see the artist's rendition beside the fossil. This is such an important fossil because it shows us what a transition looked like. Dinosaurs, which are reptiles, and birds are very different from each other. Dinosaurs do not have a keel, the large extension on the breastbone that wing muscles attach to, nor do they have feathers but they do have teeth, a bony tail, and separate fingers in their forelimbs. Birds do have a keel and feathers, but birds don't have teeth or bones in their tails, and the fingers in their forelimbs are fused together into little nubs. Archaeopteryx exhibits a mix of traits that show the transition between these two organisms. The fossil of Archaeopteryx shows that it does have feathers like a bird, but the rest of its features are different from a bird and more like a reptilian dinosaur. This fossil shows an organism that is clearly in transition between a previous organism and a subsequent one. And finally, the fossils in various regions resemble the living things currently alive in those regions. There is a connection and relationship between today's living things and what used to live in the same location. This is evidence of the change from those previous organisms into the modern ones. For example, we only find recent fossil marsupials in South America and Australia, the two parts of the world where marsupials currently live. We don't find recent fossil marsupials in Europe, which has no living marsupials. As another example, armadillos, as shown in the top picture, are found in South America and Southern North America, and that's the same place where we find fossils of glyptodonts. These organisms share a number of obvious features with armadillos that are very different from those possessed by other mammals elsewhere. The geologic record provides some of the best evidence for the process of evolution. The world is old, and the rocks are full of the remains of the ancestors of the animals and plants that live today. If you enjoyed this video, then go ahead and click the usual things. 